Welcome back to another installment of Ask Eddie and Anne, uh, presented by the Film Noir Foundation. Uh, I, I appreciate all the great questions that people send in, and uh, we're going to see how we do tonight. Anne, how are you feeling? I'm feeling really good. Yeah, actually. I was a little tired, but I had my dinner and some tea, and I'm feeling ready to go. Okay, well, I, I feel pretty good, too. Today was a, today was a good day. I've got my uh, cocktail here. I'm having a uh, a restorative adult libation, and uh, it was fun. I had a, I had a good day. I did a I did a, a very fun interview today for TCM for an upcoming Noir Alley episode uh, of I'm showing the Killers, the Don Siegel version of the Killers, and I did a very fun interview uh, earlier today with Clue Gulliger. Who, oh, yeah. play, who plays Lee, one of the killers. Uh, it's, it's weird because, he, you know, he's obviously with Lee Marvin, but his name is Lee in the movie. And I yeah. always wondered if they like got mixed up because of that. <laughs> anyway, Clue, who is 92 years old and is sharp as a tack and just a wonderful guy. And we had the, we had a really fun time doing this. This is, <laughs> this is how we did it, you know. So uh, everybody can look forward to that at some I think that's going to be in late January on, on TCM. Yeah, so I was anyway. just yeah. No, I was just gonna say I was watching the Nightmare on Elm Street documentary. It goes through the mm -hmm. whole series and he was in Nightmare too and he's hilarious when they interview him. Oh he he is he is very funny, you know. Yeah like I, you'd ask him a question and uh, about you know oh there's this scene where you did this and then you know you uh the you baked Norman Fell in the steam bath, and Clue just goes, yeah, he had it coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he, but he is the kindest, sweetest guy. I, I just love that dude. And you know that he comes to all the Noir City festivals in Hollywood. Yeah. He, he sits front and center, first row, dead center, and uh, it, it's just weird. I mean, I, 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 I have a hard time actually going on stage to introduce the movies if clue isn't there yet it's like you know holding for clue where, <laughs> where is clue you know but anyway it was good so where what shall we do let, let, oh i know what we're gonna do because <laughs> you prompted me for this already but i don't take instruction very well so, so uh we're going to talk about the conclusion of the Noir, first online version of the Noir City Festival, which just ended uh, in conjunction with the American Film Institute Silver Theater in Silver Spring, Maryland, which was a tremendous success. Uh, it, uh, they were extremely pleased. And uh, financially, I have to say, it was, the, it was the most successful of the 12 years that we've been doing it in Silver Spring, this was the most financially successful version of the festival, even though it was online. So um, that was great. So if there are people watching this now who are saying, what festival? What? Huh? What happened? Boy, are you guys late to the party? Uh, but you're not out of luck because clearly that it worked so well and it was so um, seamless and easy for people to use that uh, it's something we will definitely do again. Uh, so I know a lot of people are curious about the festivals in 2021. Um, there, there are obviously, until further notice, there aren't going to be any live festivals. We'll have to just see how things develop, uh, but we will certainly be doing online versions. So. Anita Manga, who is always works with me on the programming and booking of the films for the live show in San Francisco at the Castro, she and I are putting together the program right now that we desire, and then we'll have to see uh, what we can actually get. Because as I've mentioned before on, on these talks, and I don't want to go into it in any massive detail, Everything is in flux right now, so studios may provide you with something to stream one month and then their plans change the next month because somebody in marketing says, you know, we can do this ourselves, why are, you know, what, whatever. It, it's, 
it's the wild west. And so anything can kind of happen, but uh, the experience of this last festival was really, really good. Obviously most of it, except for two movies were foreign films. And it oddly is probably a little easier to arrange to stream those films than it will be to stream um, content owned by the studios in this country, but yeah. we'll see. So um, that, that's like a preemptive thing. If anybody has <laughs> questions about are there festivals coming up or are you gonna do this again online or whatever, uh, the answer is definitely yes, we will do it again online, but that does not preclude us going back to doing live festivals when it's safe to do so. Yeah, and kind of one of the nice things about um, the DC festival was that people who could, would not be able to travel for it you know, were able to attend virtually. And also something that we had not done before is we actually had our uh, North City Festival t-shirt on sale online, which we don't normally do. And we've extended that till the t-shirt sales to the end of the year. So for your holiday shopping, consider buying a t-shirt. It is on our uh, website, uh, filmnoirfoundation.org. And you can also buy souvenir programs from this uh, from the festival as well on there. Yeah, and, and uh, the the sales of that merchandise uh, were were good, uh, it, you know. And I hope the I'll just throw one little caveat in there. When we formed the foundation, it was we do really good premiums, but this was never our thing. Yeah, and and. Uh, so people need to understand that uh, we are not a fulfillment house. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and we don't, we tried that route once upon a time where we used a service that does this kind of stuff like manufacture, distribute. And yeah. I found the quality of the products very lacking. Yeah. And so we produce, we manufacture and produce all this stuff ourselves, but it's a, we're a small operation. And so when people, you, you know, you're hearing all this stuff in the news right now about get your Christmas shopping done and get it stuff in the mail immediately. I cannot stress how, you know, important that I can already tell you if you haven't ordered t-shirts and stuff for Christmas gifts now, it's going to be dicey as to whether they're going to get to you in time. Just, I, I, I don't want to detour down this road, but no. I, I, I do a lot of the shipping <laughs> myself, right? And I went You're to- a small operation. <laughs> uh, well, and, and Eric Sagan, who is like the shipping yeah. department. Yeah. Uh, but I, I had to ship some stuff the other day, UPS, and it, it was a zoo. Yeah. It was a zoo because I went right to the distribution center and it was amazing how many people were coming off the street that they had just hired to put on because of the crush Yeah, uh, because everybody is buying online now. So that's, yeah. that's just a roundabout way of right. saying, please be patient because we, we got you covered because we have the product, but it's going to take a little while to get it to you. Yes. We are not, that big A word that I'm not going to say. We are not <laughs> them. So yeah, you're not going to get it in one or two days. But we all, okay. we, yes, but we all get bathroom breaks. So, exactly. so <laughs> there's the advantage. Um, so let, let's answer some questions. Let's see what we can do for these folks tonight. Okay. Um, this is from Paul Wood. Has there been any consideration uh, of having a North City Festival in Toronto? Of course, pre or post virus. Uh, no, but that, but that doesn't mean it can't happen. So Paul Wood, here's the thing. If you want that to happen, you need to send us an idea of where, where that would occur. Like what's the optimum venue for a festival? We love to do stuff in a, a fairly large house that maybe is a vintage movie theater. That's what always works best for us. Um, so, so just let us know if that's of interest to you. Uh, you know, we re that's how a lot of these satellite festivals have come about is people in those cities saying, I really want one here. Here's how we can help make it happen. So I'm not saying 
yes, it's going to happen. I'm not saying no, it's not going to happen. But uh, if if Toronto is a great city, we've never done one, an official Noir City Festival outside the United States. But, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm more than open to it. Um, and this one is from Doug. If the Prowler is perv noir, is there another film that circles the same territory? And I'm sorry, <laughs> that was that was also Paul Wood. Oh, okay. Uh, that's funny. That's Elroy. That's James Elroy's thing. He he yeah. is the one who uh, who coined perv noir, a, a, a very specific subgenre, uh, perv noir. Uh, I, I'm going to say that the the perviest film that I've seen that I could still call noir is Who Killed Teddy Bear? Have you, have you seen this film? No, I have Teddy not seen Bear? this film. With Sal Mineo and Juliette Prowse and Elaine Stritch is in it and, and Jan Murray plays a cop, plays the investigating guy and he is very pervy in, in the yeah. movie. But it, it was a mid-60s uh, film. I'm drawing a blank right now on on the director, uh, but it it is a really pervy movie. I remember seeing it when I was a teenager and feeling like I needed to take a couple of hot showers after watching this movie. Uh, and so I it, and it's now on a Blu-ray, and I I reviewed it in the Noir City magazine. Yeah, but that's that's the perviest uh, noir that I know of. And it's photographed by Joseph Brunn, and it's beautifully done, uh, who is the guy who photographed Odds Against Tomorrow. He was, oh, okay. he was specifically a New York-based cinematographer, and he really knew how to shoot New York to get the maximum creep factor out of it. So th that's the one I will recommend. There, there are, I'm sure, some others from the classic period. I mean, that's a mid-60s film, but um, that, that's the one I'm going with. The ultimate perv noir, in my estimation. Um, Eddie and Anne, have either of you seen Francis Ford Coppola's The Cotton Club Encore, the 2017 cut, not the 1984 original cut? If so, noir or not, Doug? I have not seen it. Have you seen it? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I haven't seen it yet. I, I, I would be, I'm very interested in seeing it because I'm kind of fascinated by uh, how Coppola is you know, revisiting his movies later in his life. And because of all the digital technology, you know, he can now alter things and put stuff back and all this stuff, uh, you know, I'm not gonna say easily, but easier than he could have done it years ago. Um, I, I'm just, I don't know, noir or not, I don't know. I'm, I, I will say this just to vamp on a possible answer here. I mean, it was obvious that the Cotton Club was an attempt by Robert Evans, the producer, to, to capture lightning in a bottle again, like he did with Chinatown. Yeah. And that it was going to be like the New York version of Chinatown and even more of a traditional Hollywood movie, which was really what Evans loved. And he wanted to make new versions of you know, old style films and this one with the gangsters and kind of the Warner Brothers feel and the music and all that stuff. Uh, you know, whether he's, they succeeded or not, I don't know. I didn't particularly love the original cut that I saw. And I, I know that the new cut has a lot more of Gregory Hines in it, which is to me a good thing. Yeah. And I, I look forward to seeing it and that I'll, I'll let you know whether I think it, I mean, if the question is, is it noir or not? I mean, how can, having said what I just said, I feel that Chinatown is a noir. So how could I then say, well, but the Cotton Club is not because why it has too much music or something? I don't know. But, um, and, and the screenplay was by William Kennedy, who is one of my favorite novelists. Uh, doesn't mean he can write a screenplay, but I, I need to revisit it. And uh, I plan to do that pretty soon. Uh, let's see. Uh, this is, is uh, much more a comment than a question, but have you noticed that the resemblance of uh, Chris Christie to Raymond Burr's noir villains? I mean, you mean Chris Christie? That 
<laughs> yeah, no, I'll stop myself there. You know, that, yeah. He actually sent photos when he sent the email, which of course I can't reproduce for you, but he really did look like him. It was kind of weird. Okay, but here's the thing. Chris, here's the thing. Chris Christie doesn't scare anybody. Well, yeah. <laughs> I mean, no, no, no. yeah. Please. And and do, do you think <clears throat> Raymond Burr would go in and kowtow to somebody like Donald Trump? I don't think so. I don't think so. so. <laughs> no. So I, I kind of get where he's going with that question, but no, no. I, I don't see Chris Christie stalking Elizabeth Scott in Pitfall. I, you know, no, I, I, no. I, see, I see like that great scene in Pitfall, you know, where he is like sexually harassing her in the department store. Yeah. Like the house detective would just throw Chris Christie right out in the street. <laughs> right. So I, I don't see Raymond Burr. No, I don't. I don't. I'm not buying that one. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, what actors, actresses had the most unfortunate demises at the end of their lives? I can think of Gail Russell and Barbara Payton. Can you provide information on these folks or have suggestions of others? Phil from Massachusetts. Oh, my God. I know, where do you stop? Phil, come on. Have you read my book, Dark City, The Lost World of Film Noir? <laughs> it, it's funny because, uh, I, you know, I've just done the revision of that book. And the new editor and the folks at TCM who kind of vetted the manuscript, uh, it had to go through their legal department as well you know, even though they didn't have say so over it, they just wanted to make sure I wasn't saying anything that was going to compromise the network and all that. But it was duly noted that I didn't really miss anybody's dreadful demise in that book. I mean, if they had a bad death, it is accounted for in that book. Um, you know, it's funny, Phil, the last week, I showed uh, Kiss Me Deadly on TCM and even I wouldn't and couldn't go into the particulars of Albert Decker's demise. Uh, he, he plays the villain in Kiss Me Deadly, uh, but that, that was a pretty gruesome way to go, you know? Yeah. And, uh, you know, again, I don't want to, uh, you know, people might be watching this stuff while they're eating dinner at their dinner table or something. And I don't want to be, yeah, too, too provocative. But we I mean, do have can... an article about Decker and his demise in North City E Magazine. We have a back issue of it, um, which you can go through our website to find. Um, I think it's issue number four, but I'm not positive. <laughs> yeah, it was. It wasn't that long ago. I mean, it was two, two or three issues ago uh, right. th that we did it. Uh, yeah, Steve Cronenberg wrote that. It was. It was really good. Uh, that that's like a gruesome, ghastly, ugh, what the hell? And a kind of an unsolved crime. Uh, you know, there there are a lot of sad demises. Laird Kriegar was was one, but that you know he killed himself by you know taking too many drugs and losing too much weight too fast. Yeah. Uh, Steve Cochran had an amazingly bizarre death aboard ship. Uh, you know, hypothermia uh, with an all female crew on his uh, on his boat uh, another yeah. article in north city magazine yeah we we cover this stuff come on <laughs> phil get on board we cover this stuff <laughs> uh, subscribe to north city magazine you give us 20 bucks and you get great stories and and, and you know all the gruesome details <laughs> of your favorite actor's demise oh. um would very much like to know the average salary salary of a film noir movie star in the 40s or 50s. One flat fee is what I would guess. Uh, how would that salary translate to today's, today's dollars? Related to that, not necessarily to noir stars, when did stars begin to trade on their star power and negotiate percentages of the gross mm. residuals? See you in the uh, shadows, Anthony. That, that's a good question, Anthony. I. I, uh, it's funny, you know, as, as much as I get into the background of stuff in old Hollywood, salaries is something that I don't, I don't delve into. When it appears, it's duly noted. And I say, oh, that's interesting. But, I, I, 
you know, I'm, I'm just not a money guy. You know, I'm, I'm much more into the creative decision-making stuff. But, you know, the way it worked back then is that in the studio system, that was everybody had a weekly salary that they got paid, you know. And the, then the studio could loan them out for much more money yeah. while the actor or actress still got what their weekly salary was according to the contract. So the studios are the ones who made the money. So if you had, uh, you know, just if you had Dana Andrews at Fox and he was making, let's say, $2,000 a week at five, which is not far off. I mean, most, most actors and actresses, when they were put under contract, were making $500, $750 a week, thereabouts. And then they would, it would bump up as, as they proved their popularity. And then if they were loaned to another studio, that meant that they were really wanted. So their home studio could say, yeah, you're going to, you're going to have to pay him $5,000 a week. But if Fox was only paying Dana Andrews $2,000 a week, Fox was keeping the 3000 bucks, yeah. right? They were, they were making that money, which is what eventually led to actors rebelling and, you know, people like uh, Olivia de Havilland and Joan Leslie and Jimmy Stewart and all these people, uh, kind of bucking the system and saying, you know, we don't want to be indentured servants. We want to be paid a fair market value. Like that, that's the way Stanwick always operated. I mean, she never signed a deal with one studio. She went freelance and just got the fair market, you know, whatever it was at the time, which led to her being for a while, the highest paid woman in America. You know, in the, in the early 1940s. So she was a pretty savvy businesswoman, in addition to being the greatest actress in the history of motion pictures. I love Barbara. <laughs> oh, my God. I just watched, uh, you know, I hosted uh, a night of pre-code movies yeah. on TCM the other night. And just watching her again in Babyface. Oh, is, God, she's so great in that. Is incredible. I mean, already, you know, she's just in her 20s and she's just starting out and it's like a master class in acting. I, I said to my wife, you know, th this is where film acting really begins because she is able to say things with one word. There's like a scene in Babyface where somebody says something to her and she just goes, yeah. <laughs> and that's it. That's the line. And, and it's just like, it's, it's everything. It's everything that you need to know about the character. So anyway, off the, off the subject there. Yeah. Um, how would you uh, classify prison films in the world of noir? Since mostly, most contain purely male or female characters, you don't get the sexual tension, tension prevalent in most film noirs. But films like Brute Force and Cage obviously have the uh, look and feel of noir. Joe Smith. Uh, what, what's this uh, person's name again? Uh, question? Joe Smith. Joe. Good question, Joe. Um, in the book I just uh, finished, the revised and expanded version of Noir City, I, there's a chapter on prison noir. And uh, it was something I really wanted to put in the original book, but it didn't work out for various reasons. So Brute Force was the only prison movie that I talked about in the original version of the book. But this time I talk about many, many more. Uh, and yes, it, I just think that to ignore them and, and leave them out during the noir era was a mistake because uh, they, they are their own subset of, I mean, it's a genre unto itself, right? It, I mean, I'm trying to remember what the line was that I say in the book. It's like prison movies are like penitentiaries themselves. They're there. They've always been there, but nobody really pays attention to them because they're on the outskirts of town. Nobody wants to go there. Nobody really wants to see it, but they're, they're there. And that has always been the case with cinema. I mean, prison movies have been a thing from the very beginning yeah. of film, right? And, and you, you see why, because it's just built-in drama. 
everybody there has a story of how they ended up at this dead end. And then you, you learn their stories and there's all these inherent conflicts between the prisoners and the authority and the, you know, and you can use it so symbolically like they do in brute force. Uh, so yeah, I, I do consider them to be part of the film noir movement, but I write about them as this is how it appeared during the film noir movement because they were, they were different, you know, and, and, and I also get into women in prison movies, which were a, a very different thing than what they would turn into yes. in, the, in the 1960s, right? They, they, women in prison movies were very serious once upon a yeah. time, you know? Uh, and, and then when you could start showing nudity and stuff on screen, they became something else because it was like, ah, oh, this is great. You know, we'll, we'll exploit this. Uh, but, you know, a film like Caged is, was a very, very serious movie, even though now it plays as camp because all those later films messed with the, the template to make it funny, you know? And then when, yeah. once, you know, you get, um, oh, I'm drawing a blank. The guy, the guy who did the satire, Sorry, I can't remember his name right now. He, he, there was a stage play that was a satire of women in prison movies and uh, Divine played the, the matron, you know, like yeah. the Hope Emerson part in Cage was played by Divine. And then that just blows the whole thing up, right? And then yeah. ret retroactively, all of those films become kind of campy. I don't know. I found Cage very upsetting. It is. It is. I mean, I didn't, it didn't feel campy at at all to me. I mean, there was some sort of comic relief with Faye Emerson's character, except she was also just sort of really awful at the same time. So it wasn't even that, you know, I found that film really upsetting. As it should be. Yeah. Uh, and you're absolutely right. I mean, it was written by Virginia Kellogg, who went undercover in these prisons as an inmate in order to get the information she needed to write this effective screenplay. Well, she wrote the story and then Bernie Schoenfeld wrote the screenplay. But um, it was it was not a campy thing at all. It was deadly serious. You know, Jerry Wald took that picture very, very seriously. Um, so yeah, they're, they're, the answer to that question is yes, I do consider prison films to be part of the noir movement. Um, granted, uh, there is an abundance of pre-noir, neo-noir, and noir-inspired films. Are you aware of the existence of a master list of traditional film noir films or something close to one? If so, is this list available to regular folks who may or may not necessarily be friends of Carlotta? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's, I, I'm going to give props to... Uh, I'll give props to a guy who... who uh, went down this road w way before I did, a fellow named uh, Spencer Selby, who wrote a book called Dark City, right, that I think came out in the 80s. And I think he did essays on 25 noir films or something. But then in the back of his book, he had a list of like 400 movies that he considered to be noir. Now these are all American movies and most of the ones on that list, I don't really have much of an argument with. And I find myself returning to his list again and again, just, just the way this fella was asking, is there a master list that you can refer to? I find myself referring to uh, Spencer Selby's list quite often. Uh, it's, it's funny that, you know, now, if you went on our noircity.com site for the film festival, you can find in there a list of everything that we have shown at every Noir City film festival. And we are little by little creeping up <laughs> on that entire list. I mean, pretty soon we'll have shown just about everything. Yeah. Uh, so, so you can use either of those two resources. 
And by the way, that was Nathan that submitted that question. Nathan, Nathan. Good question, Nathan. Uh, did they ever show Seventh Victim on TV or DVD with the alternate ending, Three Leads in a Restaurant? That's, that seems to be the way I remembered it, Ellen. Yeah, you know, Ellen, several people have asked me this since I showed the film on uh, Noir Alley a few weeks ago, on Halloween, in fact. Um, I do not recall that ever being the case. Every time I've seen the film, it, it has the fabulous ending with the shot of the door and you hear the sound of the chair kicking out from beneath Gene Brooks. Um, and as I said, there, there was originally intended to be the ending of, of all of her friends meeting and talking in a restaurant afterwards, but Val Luton cut that out. Yeah. And, and I just, I, I can't for the life of me imagine that Val Luton, who had complete control over his movies at RKO, that there would be two versions of this film. And I, I, I happen to think that people when they hear that there's this other ending, they, in their mind, there are, there are scenes in the film of these yeah. characters talking in restaurants. Right. And I think people just imagine, oh, I saw that. That was the, I saw the original ending. It's like, no, you saw that scene elsewhere in the movie. But it was never the end of the movie that was, that was released. And once it was released, that, that was it, you know? Yeah. Um, in the October Ask Eddie, I was motivated by your statement that we need, we need not only to give credit to the directors only for the success of Noir. Uh, I found a key component to the success of uh, Noir's uh, is, is, sorry, is the masterful artistic impact of three-time Oscar winner uh, oh. Miklos Rezosa's scores. Um, are there other composers who impacted Noir for us to enjoy? And that's from Lawrence. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I don't give sufficient credit to the composers as I probably should, because I have learned, especially since doing the gig on TCM, uh, how much the music and the scoring means to people. Yeah. Uh, there's no question that Miklos Roja is, in, is the noir composer of the classic noir era. Uh, you know, Double Indemnity, The Killers, Crisscross. I mean, th those are kind of the sound of noir, um, at least in the 40s when the string, orchestral strings was the big thing. Then in the 50s, it kind of changed uh, as jazz became more prevalent. Uh, and it, it's kind of interesting to note that when people think about noir, they always think about jazz. Yeah, even though it's not. It's even though not it's really, not in the uh, films, it, it yeah. really isn't in the film, yeah. right? I, I, it's all orchestral scoring, classic mm -hmm. European classical orchestral scoring, you know? Yeah. And, and the, yeah, and every studio had a composer that was their house guy. Now, whether they had a particular affinity for noir or not. I mean, I think Roja's scores are so good and because that score for the killers was kind of co-opted a little bit by Jack Webb and Dragnet, mm -hmm. that that just became so um, synonymous with the noir sound, you know. Um, but, you know, Franz Waxman, Max Steiner, Roy Webb at RKO, uh, you know, th there were a lot of these fabulous composers uh, who did a lot of this stuff. You know, I mean, Alfred Newman at Fox, you know, uh -huh. with Street Scene, the, the ubiquitous street scene. That you yeah. Um, yeah, uh, it, it's fantastic. And one of the things I love most about it is how the music continues to inspire musicians today, because I find that probably there is more love for classic film noir in music than, than any of the other arts, mm -hmm. where, where musicians, whether they're rock musicians, singer songwriters, jazz musicians, classical musicians, they all are drawing from these original noir scores. 
for their inspiration for stuff that they're doing now. M even more than you see um, directors or writers, certainly cinematographers, uh, you know, the, the music has stuck more than anything else, which is kind of surprising. No. Um, I'm really happy that Eddie's book will largely be coming back in, into print into 2021. Uh, particularly looking forward Thank to my you. copy of Dark City Dames. I wonder if Eddie has plans uh, to write any more books, either fiction or nonfiction. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> the answer is yes. That is that is the plan. Okay, and then follow. You know, up writing writing is a wonderful quarantine activity. <laughs> so yes, I've complained. You know, when I have complained in recent years about not having enough time to write, it's because I'm traveling around doing all these film festivals and all that stuff. What's my excuse now? <laughs> And a follow-up question, uh, does the distance from this subject and the general lack of living subjects who were there the first time around preclude some books that you would have otherwise liked to write or have written? And this um, is from Andy. Hmm. Um, you know, that, that's funny. I don't dwell on that, but I do think about it from time to time. Like, man, I wish this person was still alive so I could interview them and talk to them and, and you know, it, it doesn't preclude, if you want to do it, you can still do it, right? If you want to do a biography of somebody, they don't have to be alive in order to do it. But I was certainly um, fortunate when I did Dark City Dames that all those women, I mean, that was the whole point of doing the book is that I talked to them directly and they told me things that they never would have told just another interviewer, you know, because I took so much time and I spent so much time with them and got to know them and had an interest in their personal lives, not just their career, that they realized, well, this is it, you know, this is going to be my testimony. And that's a very special thing. You don't have to have that in order to write a biography of somebody, but man, it sure helps. So yeah, there aren't too many of those left. You know, there's, there's Norman Lloyd is it really for yeah. the guys, you know, uh, God love her. Marsha Hunt is still going, you know, at 103 or whatever, 102, 103. Um, you know, but um, the, the answer to that is no, that, that, that the fact that all these people have passed away does not, that's not what stops me from writing about them. It's just that I, at this point, I'd rather write other things and leave, like I was, I was thinking about writing a book about Joan Harrison, but when Christina Lane did it, it's like, fantastic. Now, you know, more power to you. I mean, and she did a beautiful job with that book, the Phantom Lady book. So that's it. <laughs> Um, I love an out-and-out -out noir crime film as much as anyone, but I've become very interested in noir films and books that are what I heard described as crime adjacent. Films like In a Lonely Place, Detour, Detour Pitfall, or the books of David Goodis and Patrick Hamilton. Um, can you recommend any little-known films, and particularly books, that come at noir from this angle? Hmm. Wow, that's a, that's a tough question because that's that's very very broad and i would say that you know david goodis is is not noir adjacent david goodis is is noir yeah and uh it's just interesting because all of those uh those examples that are mentioned there are books that do kind of fit snugly in the crime fiction genre that that's what the authors knew they were writing i mean dorothy hughes in a Lonely Place was the, uh, I'm, I'm pretty certain that won the Mystery Writers of America Award for Best Novel in 1947, I think. Uh, so it was a work of crime fiction. Uh, it, it feels noir adjacent when you watch the movie, 
because you're wondering, well, where's, where's the crime, right? There's, there's this off screen murder that happens. Uh, but of course that's not the book. The book is a very different thing. Um, you know, that I, I'm going to be a little stumped by that because e even though my bookshelves here are filled with these books, I'm trying to like, be very specific because the writers that were cited here, like Goodis and Charles Williford and these, you know, I think of them as noir writers, you know, Jim Thompson, Patricia Highsmith. Uh, I don't, I don't think of these people as, as ancillary to, to crime fiction. To me, they are crime fiction. So uh, I, I kind of come at it from a slightly different point of view, because to me, it's detective fiction that is not necessarily noir. Yeah. Right? Uh, so James M. Cain and Patricia Highsmith and Jim Thompson, David Goodis, Charles Williford, even Patrick Hamilton. I mean, these are writers to me who are totally noir as opposed to detective fiction or right. whodunits or something like that. That, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean it's noir. So uh, I, I wish I could come up with a better answer for you. Uh, I'll think about it and I'll, I'll post something like my 10 favorite noir adjacent novels or movies or something. Yeah, and I would say like Charlotte Armstrong would kind of be a good contender for being noir adjacent um, because her stuff is really firmly rooted sort of in the um, sort of domestic scene and, and family conflict, which can certainly yeah. feel noirish. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, that's a, that's a really good example. She, she's a fine example of a writer who nobody really thinks of as noir, yet they've adapted some of her things and turned them into noir. You know, The Unsuspected uh, is, is a Charlotte Armstrong story, Don't Bother to Knock. Mm -hmm. uh, was uh, her novel Mischief that was turned into a very noir film. She, I think she also wrote the short story that they made um, talk about a stranger. The the it's like a little boy who cried wolf. Have you seen that one with Billy Gray, where he's the kid whose dog gets poisoned and he blames the oh yeah 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 yeah, yeah 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 she she wrote that as well. And, and all of those are, are noir. Although I have to tell you, Anne, I've kind of learned my lesson because I've shown three kid noir things on Noir Alley. And I didn't realize there's a subset of people in this country who hate kids. <laughs> 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 who are just like, don't show the kid movies again, you know? And, and I mean, you can't, I mean, The Window is a great movie. Shadow on the Wall is a great movie. You know, talk about a stranger. I really, I, I get a lot out of that movie. But man, you show a movie with a kid protagonist and like, that's not film noir, you know? Yeah, well, I mean, it, the thing I like about the ones with the kid protagonist, um, and this is also like how I feel about uh, Invaders from Mars, which is one of the greatest sci-fi films uh, ever is the powerlessness of children. Yeah. So it really amps up the conflict and the suspense because they're automatically handicapped, handicapped because they are children, people don't fucking believe them. So. Night of the Hunter, Night oh, of the Hunter, come yeah. on. Yeah. I mean, how fabulous is, you know, with, with Lillian Gish protecting the kids against Harry Powell, you know, it's, it's fantastic. Yeah. It's such a great movie. Um, is Inferno starring Robert Ryan, Rhonda Fleming, the only film noir filmed in both 3D and color? If not, what are the others? Uh, Dan from Minnesota. Uh, I, I think it is. I know Man in the Dark is the other one that I have shown with Edmund O'Brien and Audrey Totter. Uh, Which is 3D, but shot in glorious black and white. Exactly. Um, there's another one. Oh, I'm drawing a blank. It, I think, oh, The Glass Web. The Glass Web, which is a kind of a noirish sort of thing uh, set in early television. Uh, 
And that I believe was shot in 3D, but that's, that's black and white. Yeah. And of course, I, the jury, which we're all waiting to see finally restored, pardon me, uh, in 2021, uh, shot by John Alton in 3D, in glorious mm -hmm. black and white. So yeah, I think Inferno is the only one. And it's interesting because that's why so many people don't consider it to be a noir film is because it's in color and it's in broad daylight and it's out yeah. in the middle of nowhere. And, and my answer to people who don't consider Inferno to be noir is it is the postman always rings twice from the victim's point of view. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's what that story is. I mean, I don't know what took people so long, right? It was like almost 10 years before somebody figured, let's just tell the story from the husband's point of view. Yeah. You know, the lovers want to knock him off and they leave him in the desert to die. And he survives. Oh, spoiler. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but he's Robert Ryan. Ryan. Do you seriously think that nature can defeat Robert Ryan? <laughs> Oh, he's so no great way. in it. He's really great in it. That uh, is one of the that is one of the best voiceovers ever in a movie because it, it he acts twice, right? He has to do yeah. all the physical acting when he's actually on location. Then he goes back in a nice comfortable recording booth to relive the whole thing and do these internal monologues yeah. over the action. And the internal monologues are as, are as strained and pained and agonized as what he's actually doing physically. It's a tremendous performance. It, it is. I just, I, I, I love seeing it um, up on the big screen, which was great. In 3D. <laughs> um, I am sure you've been asked this many, many times, but given Jeff Bridges' announcement regarding his health issues, what are your thoughts on the Coen brothers' Chandler homage to Big Lebowski. Steve. Uh, I, Steve, I like it. Like, like, like everybody else, right? Uh, it's, it's very funny. I, I, will, I will admit that I, I didn't love it when I first saw it, but over time, uh, it, it really, it, it just holds up. I mean, they're, they're so smart. They're, because their satire isn't just superficial. They really understand the mechanics of detective fiction. Yeah, and, yeah. And it, it's so beautifully satirizing the pacing and the rhythms and how, you know, these ancillary characters who drop in. And I, it's just, it's great. It, I, I like the movie very much. I'm very surprised. Uh-oh, Eddie's going to get slightly political for a moment. I'm very surprised that nobody cashed in in the last four years on t-shirts that said, shut the fuck up, Donnie. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that was a missed opportunity. That was a, that was a missed opportunity because I, you know, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, hi, Eddie, Ann, and the cats. I was wondering, have you ever reappraised a performance or a film after interviewing someone involved in the production? And that's Samantha. Uh, that's a really good question. Um, thank you, Samantha. Um, I have not reappraised the film Catherine. or the performance. I may reappraise the person. You know, um, and, and, you know, you interview somebody and it's like, ah, oh, this person's a jerk. I didn't realize they were such a jerk. Yeah. But that would, that would never influence me to say, I'm going to rethink the, the performance that they gave, or I'm going to rethink the direction of the film. It, it, it just doesn't, it just doesn't work that way. So, and nor if I don't like the movie and suddenly I meet this person, I talk to them and they're great. It, it's not going to change my mind <laughs> yeah. about my initial reaction to their work. Uh, it may color my reaction to future work, which you have to be really careful about. 
you know, because if you end up liking somebody, then you're going to be predisposed towards maybe thinking favorably of work to come. Yeah. Uh, but no, that, that has never, that has never happened with me. I mean, if I, if I like to go back to dark city dames, I mean, I obviously interviewed those women and I hadn't seen everything they'd done. I saw the noir stuff, but I hadn't seen everything. And honestly, you know, they were all capable of giving a less than great performance in these movies. Yeah. And, and I've seen them. I've seen those less than great performances. And I'm, I don't think, oh no, she was really terrific in that movie. You know, people, I got it all wrong. It's like, no, eh, that was a paycheck. That one was a yeah. paycheck. A, nothing wrong with that. Um, which more films have the best theater poster regardless of the quality of the film? Personally, I really like Pick Up with Barbara Michaels. Uh, uh, with Barbara Michaels, which reminds Beverly, me of... Beverly uh, Michaels. Yes. They may have written Barbara Michaels. They wrote Barbara, but it's Beverly, Beverly Michaels, Beverly. you're correct. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, the poster reminds me a lot of your North City number four poster, which I own. Would you can would you consider reprinting North City 9, who's crazy now since it's out of print? <laughs> <laughs> so you answer the poster question first, then you go back and answer the then question. Then you go back and you ask for, well, we can't reprint a poster for one person. <laughs> but get this person's, let's, let's track this person down and get their information. Because the other day I found a Noir City 9 poster. Okay. I, I, and I'd be happy to let them have it. I do not know why we had so much few, so many fewer Noir City 9 posters. We printed that poster on heavier stock. And I guess that meant that we did fewer of them. Uh, but anyway, the, to answer the question, uh, I, I am obligated to say that my favorite film noir poster is out of the past. Uh, that's, that is my favorite poster because I paid a lot of money for it. <laughs> uh, next to my house and my car, that's the most money I've ever paid for an, an object, if you, you know, and, um, and that was a long time ago. And it is now I'm happy to say appreciated considerably and you can't even get near it for like four times what I paid for it. But it was, it was a significant expenditure. Anyway, I love that poster. I wish I could, wish I had a copy to hold up, but William Rose was the artist. It, it's beautiful. The picture of Mitch Jim and Jane Greer and the, like the negligee and the, him with the dangling cigarette, very much like uh, the pickup poster. I yeah. mean, it's like, the, it's like the male equivalent of the pickup poster because Mitchum looks very sexy and he's got the dangling cigarette like Beverly Michaels in that poster. So. And I do know the poster she's, you know, the pickup poster is, is really good, which I don't have. So I would, I, I'm on the lookout for that one. Um, sorry. Was there a clause in, in the contracts of all directors and writers of film noir right below the Venetian blind shadow clause that required the character play Chopin on a piano or listen to Chopin being played at a concert or at least Chopin being played in a bar, or party, or nightclub? <laughs> <laughs> and you list like 10 films that he'd seen the past two months that feature them. That all are featuring Chopin, which they didn't yeah. have to pay for. The answer is they didn't have to pay for it. <laughs> It's like, we need music here. It's like, well, you know, Chopin, his agent died. Uh, you know, let's, let's use that. That's exactly why they do it. I mean, they're not paying for that. They're not paying for Moonlight Sonata, uh, you know. I mean, that's not Chopin, but, you know, they're, that's why they, uh, they want those classics, you know, because they can, they can get away with it. There's nobody to pay the money to. Sometimes it's just the simple answer. And that was question was from John. Um, Eddie and Ann, are there any black exploitation films from the 1970s that you consider to be noir? And that's from Doug and Silver Springs. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm gonna say Black Caesar uh, with Fred Williamson. That, that uh, to me, 
and you know, for the seventies, this is an interesting question because the seventies, the, the whole, um, and I know that there are a lot of people now who don't like the term black exploitation, but that was a thing. I mean, historically that's what they called the films in the business. So I still use the term black exploitation with the X, you know, yeah. uh, that was such a thing un unto itself, right? You know, Shaft and Superfly and Black Caesar and, you know, all of, there were a lot of these movies. Coffee um, and Foxy Brown, which you should oh watch. Oh, my God. Oh, of, which I should watch. You don't think I've seen the all the Pam Grill was, movies? Come on. That was for the audience, not oh, for okay. you, Eddie. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, because I am a Pam Greer fan, definitely. Me too. Uh, but it's interesting that the later... African American films that were by and large made by African American filmmakers like Boys in the Hood and uh, Juice and uh, you know New Jack City and stuff like that. Those felt a bit more noir to me than mm -hmm. the stuff from the seventies. Yeah. Uh, for whatever reason, it just it just felt like there was a take on the protagonist that was more. Um, less wish fulfillment that you saw in those yeah. 70s movies and more like the reality of scraping by you know you see something like uh well in the 70s there was cool breeze which was the black version of the asphalt jungle and then later on you saw dead presidents which was the same you know like a african-american heist film uh but to me uh, you know, um, Dead Presidents felt a bit more noir than the stuff from the 70s. So yeah. it's just very interesting that there were actually those two phases, you know. Uh, and now, of course, happily, uh, we're, we're seeing a whole renaissance in this now. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the day when it's like not a thing. Yeah. You know? Like, like um, you know, I did that uh, a gig in Chicago with Carl Franklin, the, the writer, director, Carl Franklin. And, you know, he, he's just a great director. Yeah. And, and it, it, I, I think a lot of people who came to that show were a little surprised to find out that Carl Franklin is black. Yeah. You know, uh, it, it, so that, that's good news, you know. Yeah. And Devil in the Blue Dress is... Definitely noir. It's a great film. Yeah, I, I love that movie. And one fault, one false move is oh god, off the charts, off the it's charts. It's a fantastic so film. Great. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, 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 this is from Andrew. Um, looking more closely at my copy of Scoundrels, I discovered the, the first time that Philippe Grenet, I know I mispronounced it, had already published another Hollywood book uh, about character actors. Yeah. Um, he found the French edition um, in Ease and Deserves English language publication. Is Blackpool Productions on the job? <laughs> Don't give Garnier any ideas. Uh, no. Uh, thank you very much for that question. Uh, he's referring, of course, to Scoundrels and Spitballers, which is the book that uh, I just published, uh, which is selling really, really well, I'm happy to say. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, Philippe wrote this other book about character actors in Hollywood. We have discussed the possibility of it, but he is right now um, translating it himself. Oh, wow. Fr from the French into English. That's kind of how we operate. So he does a translation at his leisure, right? And when he feels like, I like it, you know, he, because he doesn't ever want to just do something to do it. He wants to add to it and revise it and improve yeah. it and all this stuff. So uh, he does that. And, and then he gives it to me to see if, and we talk about whether I can publish it. And then, then I kind of Americanize the manuscript uh it's a we have a very nice working relationship because uh philippe trusts me very much and which i appreciate and 
I, I am very true to his work. So he has very specific style in which he writes that, that is not mine. <laughs> yeah, he has totally different approach to the language, a different approach to sentence structure. And when I work with him, I have to like change my mindset to like mm -hmm. get where, where he's going with things. And, and then I like help by saying, well, you know, Americans don't actually, they, they don't read it this way. Or the word you really want here is this, it'll shorten everything. Do you want to use it or not? And it, it's a, you know, it's fun. I love doing stuff like that. I love that kind of editing. Uh, so we'll see. That, that's a long way of saying we'll see, but it's, <laughs> it's, uh, we don't know yet. That's entirely up to Philippe and it's entirely up to me. I, would, I want to publish something else before I publish another Garnier book, but that could very well happen. Um, in the last Ask Eddie, the question came up about actors not in film noir and how they would come across in this genre. Um, one of my favorite actors that fits this question is John Wayne. I was trying to picture Wayne characters of the 40s and 50s that could fit in noir. Uh, looking for flawed characters, I thought of Red River, Island in the Sky, and The Searchers. Uh, these characters showed Wayne's ability to portray... <laughs> Sorry? The cat has to get in the act at some point. Okay, I guess he's a John Wayne fan. Um, so, he's ability... asking, so he's asking about what do I think of John Wayne in noir? Yeah. Well, it didn't, it, it never really happened. So he, he is trying to transpose the John Wayne, the Western hero into film noir. And what do I think of that? And I get where he's coming from with citing some examples of characters he played who were not the heroic John Wayne no. character. Um, probably Ethan Edwards and the searchers comes the closest to that. Uh, but I don't know. I mean, he, here's the way I'm going to answer this question. And this is a, this is a subject for further research. It would be really interesting to know if John Wayne was ever offered anything like that. Yeah. And if he was, he turned it down. Yeah. We know that he turned it down. Yeah. So the question is, was he even offered the, the, the stuff? Because, you know, what, what would it have been? You know, um, it's very hard to say. And John Wayne honestly strikes me as the kind of guy who would not go against his image. Yeah. Unle unless he was working for Howard Hawks or John Ford. Yeah. Right, because yeah. he he can't say no to those guys. Yeah, so, well, and he trusted them too. Of course, of course, and uh, but it, it's just interesting, you know. Later on, he did his, you know, um, you know, his plain clothes contemporary guy, but he was a hero, you know. He was a yeah. he was you know busting up commie spy rings and stuff in these movies. He, he, well, he was. I would, well, except I would point out McHugh, um, which uh, is a film I really like. Um, yeah, it is a good movie, yeah. And, and it is much more along a, a, a kind of somewhat rogue detective and, and in interactions with a couple, two different female characters are really interesting. Yeah. But it's not, it's not really. Noir. No, I wouldn't consider it noir. No. No. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, there were these there were these actors, big stars, who just stayed away from it completely. Yeah, you know, uh, and, and and Wayne was he was one of them. Yeah. Um, I know the film M was remade in the United States in 1951 and set in L.A. Are there other foreign film noirs that had been remade in the United States? And then there's a second question, but answer that one first. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Um, 
uh, La Chien, the Jean Renoir film La Chien was remade as Scarlet Street. Mm -hmm. um, La Bête Humaine, the, another Jean Renoir film was remade by Fritz Lang as uh, Human Desire. So there's two Fritz Lang movies right there. Mm -hmm. I know that the Siadmak film, um, I'm blanking on the French title now, uh, he made it in France, uh, but it was called Personal Column. That was remade as first Personal Column, and then uh, Lured was the title it was released under. Douglas Sirk directed that with Lucille Ball and that great supporting cast. That's a really fun movie. Yeah, Boris Carlo. Um, uh, come on, there's got, there's, that's off the top of my head. There's got to be some other ones that... Uh, yeah. Uh, but yeah, there there were oh I um, the Gabon film that was made with Henry F the Long Night uh, yeah. that a Anatole Litvak made it for RKO uh, that was uh, you know Break of Day or yeah. Daybreak uh, in France uh, in in thirty eight or so. and then and then of course I'm missing the most obvious one that was made a couple of times was Pepe Lamoco. Yeah. Uh, the Gabin film that Julien Duvivier made in 1937, which got remade as both Algiers mm -hmm. uh, and Casbah. There were two Hollywood versions of that film. Uh, so mostly it seemed um, at, in, in that era, they were French films that, that America was remaking. Because, right, the Renoir film and... Uh, and um, you know, the Duvivier film. Uh, so, oh, another one I just thought of, uh, the Henri-Georges Clouseau film, uh, La Corbeau, La Corbeau, The Raven, was remade at Fox as The Thirteenth Letter, with oh, wow. Michael, Michael Rennie and Linda Darnell. Otto Preminger directed it. Yeah. it it's sort of a missing film in a way. Yeah. Uh, I never realized that had been remade in the States. Yeah, yeah. It, but it, it's weird how it, it slipped through the cracks. Like most of that Preminger stuff at Fox has seen the light of day, right? Yeah. All, all that stuff. Laura, Fallen Angel, Daisy Kenyon, Where the Sidewalk Ends, Whirlpool, all that stuff. But where is the 13th letter? I mean, that, that's kind of a mystery. I don't know why that film has vanished. The original is fantastic. The yeah, it was a great film. It was fantastic. Yeah. Anyway, there, there's five of them. That's as good as I can do off the top of my head. Um, you frequently named your favorite NOR director is Robert C. Odmack. I admire C. Odmack very much, uh, but my preference is for Anthony Mann. Um, it seems to me that you can sense the nor grit at the edge of his frames. Make your case for CO Mac over man, Jeff Co. <laughs> Are you serious, Jeff? I'm gonna make <laughs> I'm gonna make my case for CO Mac over man. Why Why would I need to make my case? For that? Um, because I like his movies better. Uh, I love Anthony Mann movies. They're fantastic. It's just my personal taste is more towards Robert C. Admack than Anthony Mann. Uh, yeah, Mann is tougher. He's, he's, more, uh, he's more brutal. He's more into pushing your face into it than C. Admack is. C. Admack is a, is, is a more subtle director. So I guess all I'm, I, I mean, I, prefer that. I prefer uh, how Siadmak draws you into his stories and kind of seduces you, whereas Anthony Mann kind of grabs you by the collar and pulls you in and, you know, pushes you through the story. Uh, to me, that's kind of the difference between them as filmmakers is that Siadmak kind of entices you to come, even though you know it's dangerous, and Anthony Mann just kind of shoves you into it and deal with it. Yeah. Uh, you know, both are totally valid ways to, to approach making a movie. Uh, it's just that, and, and the other thing I have to say, you know, and, and I'm not trying to be uh, argumentative with Jeff here, but it's also, 
choosing a director, one director over another director, I don't really do that because the movies aren't made solely by the director. Yeah. You know, and I, I've said this numerous times. I mean, Robert's, Anthony Mann worked with John Alton, right? Yeah. <laughs> you no, got a huge, huge you got a huge leg up when you're working with John Alton. Uh, you know, and, and like I was saying about the actors earlier, it's not that these people are incapable of making a bad film, because they can. I mean, both Anthony Mann and Robert C. Admack have made films that aren't very good, right? Not when they were working with great collaborators. Yeah. Not when they were working with great scripts and great actors. So to say I prefer one over the other, it, I, I just don't see that as being a fair comparison. If you gave them both the same script and gave them the same cast and the same cinematographer and said, let's see who makes the better movie, that's a comparison that you can legitimately make. Otherwise, it's, it's, a, it's ephemeral, you know? It's like, it's just a personal taste thing. I, I just think Siad Mac has made more really good noir films that aren't entirely his responsibility. You know, he worked with Mark Hellinger as a producer. Uh, you know, he worked with Woody Bridell as a cinematographer. Uh, you know, it, it, that's just, that's kind of not the way my brain works. I don't, I don't, I don't rank people. I have my personal favorites and my preferences, but I don't, cons that's just where it ends. Yeah, no, and also, I mean, I also have, you know, filmmakers that I, I really like, but I wouldn't, and they're like a personal favorite, I wouldn't necessarily say they were like the best. John I mean, Carpenter. Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, because, yeah, I just think he's a really great filmmaker as well as being a personal favorite, and like John Ford, and, um, and he's one of the few people that if someone says, that he wasn't a good filmmaker, like, I'll get into a knife fight. I mean, that's just yeah, fucking yeah, ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. I hear you. But I, but it's just, you know, it's just that thing of, like, how, how can you like this guy more than that guy? And it's like, because I do, I guess. Like, why did I marry my wife instead of some other woman, right? Because I like her better. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> And there's a lot to like with her. I'll just say that. Um, no, just, uh, do you think uh, the movie Trapeze is, is noir stained? Oh, no, wait a minute. Let me go back to, uh, I'm sorry, Chris Anderson had also asked, he was the one who asked about M, uh, but he also asked, uh, is the plural of film noir, film noirs, or films noir? Well, the correct, the correct, if you're doing it in French, the correct pronunciation is films noir. It, there is the S. It's films, films, films noir. Uh, but if you think I'm going to say that every time I go on TV or stand in front of an audience, there's no way. So, I mean, it's interesting that this became an issue for me long ago. And when I wrote uh, Dark City, the, the first one, I just made a conscious decision that I'm not, I'm Americanizing the spelling. And it's going to be film noirs with an S at the end and live with it. I know, I know that it's not correct. Uh, like, you know, but that's okay because film, film noir has now become its own thing. Yeah. You know, it, I'm sure that I haven't looked it up in the dictionary lately, but I'm sure that it, it, has its own thing and I just think that in this country it is now accepted to say uh, I'm going to go look at a program of film noirs or, yeah. or a film noir program and, and quite honestly when I write it I will sometimes change it to, to have the grammar be less clunky you know, sometimes I, I'll just drop the S entirely because we're talking about film noir. Right. As the whole thing, rather than we're talking about a bunch of film noirs yeah. with the S on the end. So, 
Um, th that's my attitude. I think it's, it's been Americanized enough that it's acceptable to put the S on noir instead of the S on film. It's just like with femme, femmes fatale. Yeah. Right? Everybody now says femme fatales instead of femmes fatale or femmes fatales to be even more accurate, I guess. But that's it. Yeah. No, <laughs> that's all I, I just, got to say on that subject. I'll be honestly, I always just use noirs because I, I don't want to hear a comment either way. <laughs> so yeah. I just shorten it to that and then nobody, because I've actually have had people comment on both. Yeah. So it's just yeah. like, you know, so I've just shortened it and that's that. Well, you know, that that's, and you raise an interesting point, Anne, because um, I have sort of taken to talking about noir as an all-encompassing thing. Yeah. Right? Because I talk about film noir as the original artistic movement that was confined to a specific time and place almost, you know? Um, and then noir is everything that, that yeah. look, looks at stories from this particularly dark and cynical angle, whether they're novels or screenplays or stage plays or music or whatever, it's noir. This has a very noir attitude. It has a very noir perspective. And, I, and I've just taken to using that single term as opposed to inspired by film noir or right. you know, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, that was a good question. Whoever asked that question, that was a good question. Uh, that was Chris Anderson. Okay, Chris, good, good going. Let's, I'm glad we got that out in the open and now I'm never going to discuss it again. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually kind of happy about that question. Um, do you think that the movie Trapeze is noir stained? Uh, for me, watching the movie brought back memories of both Nightmare Alley and Sweet Smell of Success, uh, particularly because Burt Lancaster's character in Trapeze was so manipulative. So what do you think? And that's oh, from Andrew. Uh -huh. Uh, what I think is I'm going to have to go back and watch Trapeze again, because I'll be honest, I don't, I don't think I have seen Trapeze since, like, dialing for dollars when I was a teenager, you know. I, I know that to a guy like me, a noir head like me, the value of Trapeze is that it led to Sweet Smell of Success. Right. <laughs> Uh, because that, that's why when Burt Lancaster said, you know, this guy's not so bad and, uh, decided to cast, uh, Tony Curtis as, as Sidney Falco. Uh, but I, I honestly don't have an answer for that question because I just, I haven't seen it in so long. Um, I mean, I'm so glad that Burt Lancaster got to play a circus acrobat yeah. in a movie since that's kind of what he was. So... But beyond that, I, I don't I don't have much to add. Sorry, sorry about that one. But I, I I'll come back on at another time after I've watched the film again, and I'll give you I'll give you a more definitive answer. Um. So why don't we wrap up here because we have a lot more questions and we'll need to do them next week. Okay. Um, so. Okay. <laughs> long, oh yeah, we we ran a little long tonight, didn't we? Yeah. Yeah, we did. I probably should have cut us a little sooner, um, but we had a lot. We we have a lot more questions. Okay, uh, then let's let's just say thank thanks, Anne. Thank uh, you, Eddie. It, it was good to see you as always. And uh, who was who was it making an appearance tonight in your lap? That is Milo. Milo. Okay. Who is Great. actually my ex boyfriend's cat? Okay. And Charlotte, so you got, at least you got something good out of that arrangement. Yeah, yeah. And Charlotte picks on him nonstop. Okay, not so good. But yeah. I, I told you I'd get tizzy up here one of these days, but I don't think it's going to be tonight. I don't think it's going to be tonight. So <laughs> we'll we'll see how it goes. Maybe next time. Maybe next time. 
Okay, I want to thank thank you everybody for the questions. Uh, obviously, we lost all track of time, so there was uh, some really good questions in there. And uh, join us back here whenever the heck we do this again. Next week. Oh, next week. Okay. <laughs> next Very week. Good. Very good. <laughs> all right. So take care. See you, Ann. Bye.